Good evening, my name is Emily Underwood. I work in community engagement at the Missouri Historical Society. And on behalf of MHS, I wanna welcome you to this virtual version of the annual Hunt Fish Gather event presented by the Catherine M. Booter Center of American Indian Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Before we start, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. We begin by acknowledging that we gather today on the ancestral lands of native peoples who were removed unjustly and that we in this community are the beneficiaries of that removal. We honor them as we live, work, and study on these lands. Today, I am coming to you from the lands of the Illini Confederacy, the Osage Nation, Missouri peoples, and many other tribes who have called what is now known as St. Louis, Missouri home. Thank you. Okay, before we get started, I do have a few other things to mention. Safety is of course a top priority for us. So at the Missouri History Museum, all of our programming remains virtual for the moment, um, but we are open Wednesday through Sunday with several safety precautions in place. We would love for you to come visit us if you feel safe doing so. Advanced reservations are required to visit both the History Museum and Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. You can visit mohistory.org to uh, plan your visit and reserve free tickets. And I want to be sure to thank um, all of the members of the Missouri Historical Society for all of your support. We're so grateful for your contributions and helping us to keep history alive. If you aren't a member yet, we would love for you to consider joining us today. You can do that by visiting mohistory.org backslash support. And I also want to thank everybody who's in the St. Louis uh, County and City for your tax contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District. Some of those contributions go to support things like these STL History Live programs. These programs take place mostly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We also have monthly Soldiers Memorial Chow and Chat programs. Those are always on a Wednesday at noon. And you can find the entire lineup of programs at our website, which is mohistory.org, if you go to our calendar of events. Um, or on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page. And if you can't join us live for a program, but you want to see uh, our programs or share our programs, if you really enjoyed them and go back and watch them again, you can find most of them under our, face, uh, sorry, our YouTube channel for Missouri Historical Society. So be sure to check that out as well. Just a couple of other quick things. Um, when you close out the program today, you will notice that there is a tab that should have opened in your browser with a brief survey. We do always value your feedback. So um, hope that you'll take a minute or two to fill that out and let us know what you think about the program tonight. We sincerely appreciate that. And finally, last but definitely not least, I wanna give a very big thank you to the Catherine M. Booter Center for American Indian Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. I wanna thank them for bringing us this program. Uh, this is an annual program they normally host as a dinner and we would have loved to have done that. Of course, uh, that was not possible this time around, but we're so happy to be a part of it. And I especially wanna thank uh, the center director, um, Kelly Thompson for all of the time and energy that she has put in to uh, bringing this all together. And I'm actually going to turn the screen over to Kelly now. She's going to tell you a little bit more about the Booter Center and introduce you to our chef presenter for the evening. So thank you again so much for being here tonight. And um, Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. The screen is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. And I am so happy to be here with everyone tonight, with Emily and with Nephi and with all of those who are joining us from across across the city, across the state, across the country even. So welcome. Like Emily said, my name is Kelly Thompson and I am the director of the Booter Center. And I've been so looking forward to this event all year. It is an annual event and I'll talk a little bit more about how it got started in a moment here. But first I'd like to share a little bit about the Booter Center. So we are located in the Brown School at Washington University and we support our indigenous students who go on to become leaders in their communities, working to improve the health, the wellness, and the future of Indian country. And I'm so happy that we have many students joining us today, and I see some of our alum are in the audience as well. Some of our alum actually um, were a part of the creation of this program. And so the Hunt Fish Gather program was founded by these students who are now alum and the Booter Center in 2013. The project 
provides education to the Washington University and the local Native community on a more holistic model of health and wellness with a focus on traditional Indigenous foods. And this is different, right, than what we currently see represented in much of Westernized society. Historically and today, this program encourages the inclusion of the whole being, the spirit, the mind, the body, and the environment in a relational model of health. And I'd like to thank Emily and the History Museum for partnering with the center this year, as well as our previous partners of this event, the St. Louis Zoo and Washington University Dining Services. Nephi Craig, who will be speaking in a moment, was the original chef of this program, and he has participated many times as our guest of honor for many years, so we welcome him back. Before he comes on, I'll tell you a little bit more about who he is. He has 22 years of culinary experience in America and around the world. He is an enrolled member of the White Mountain Apache tribe and is also half Navajo. He's the founder of the Native American Culinary Association, and that's an organization and network that is dedicated to the research, refinement, and development of Native American cuisine. Hi, Nephi. <laughs> he provides training, workshops, and lecture sessions on Native American cuisine for health to schools, restaurants, universities, treatment centers, behavioral health agencies, and tribal entities across the United States and abroad. And when Nephi and Emily and I, when we talked about doing a virtual huntfish gather last year, we were all really excited. And he talked about the importance of continuing this conversation virtually while we all navigate the challenges that the pandemic has um, made for each of us. And he's going to offer us a really wonderful presentation, but also a demonstration as you can see. The title of his talk is Indigenous Foodways as Self-Care, Utilizing Food and Cooking and Adapting to a Changing World. And so I welcome Nephi. And if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation or demonstration, feel free to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom here. And Nephi? OK, <clears throat> thank you for that uh, kind of uh, kind of um, introduction and thank you for all the uh, announcements. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and uh, participate tonight with us in this special event. Uh, I'm very happy and pleased and excited to be back with you all. Uh, maybe some of you have met me before when I came out to wash, uh, wash you uh, a number of years ago. Uh, worked with uh, the dining services area there and did a lot of different really great events around native foods. And so um, um, as, as she mentioned, I'm White Mountain Apache and I'm also Navajo on my father's side. And um, my, my cooking path has brought a lot of different experiences into my life. Uh, I feel like for us in our generation of Native American cooks and chefs, we're experiencing this, um, this kind of culture shift uh, my, my pathway stretches back 23 years, but there are many, many others that uh, come before me. Um, my, typical, my path is kind of typical where I began in a culinary school, but in culinary school, I realized that uh, right away, very quickly, that there was no representation of Native peoples in the, in the world of uh, professional cooking. So um, I basically took that as a, a seed idea and decided that since I'm gonna um, be doing this for a long time in my life, I'm gonna devote my life to this, to this craft of cooking or this profession in hospitality, uh, whatever uh, you might wanna call it an industry. I looked at cooking like a fine art uh, because I heard in, cul in culinary school, that was one of the few areas that I heard the word uh, master being said. And the only other areas I heard that was like, master dancer, master carpenter, master painter, and uh, kung fu master, right? So in my mind, I kind of equated it with the fine art or martial arts. So I thought that was really neat. So I decided early on I would be committed to this for a long time. And so when I, when I encountered the fact that there was zero, little to no representation of native peoples in professional cooking, I decided that I would start something so that eventually someday when I, when I was in the industry long enough and had climbed the ranks to different positions, 
I could be able to train native chefs as well because when I, when I first started out, that was my goal. I wanted to find other native chefs that I could work and train with. And um, uh, 23 years ago, they were very difficult to find. Uh, we were not connected by social media as we are today. And so it was very difficult to uh, uh, look out and find others like me. Um, so um, kind of 23 years later, we're in that, in that position where now we are training native chefs from a native chef's perspective. And that's kind of how I mean it's a culture shift because I was trained in professional kitchens by non-natives, by Italians, French people, people from Europe, people from Asia. A lot of my culinary experience comes in from that perspective. And so, and then now um, with the foodways on this journey, it's now I'm able to teach maybe, maybe the first generation of native trained uh, native chefs. And I feel like that's a really big thing because um, for so long, we've always been kind of absorbing information as native peoples through a kind of a colonial paradigm. And so today's uh, presentation is gonna be indigenous foods as self-care. And so um, what I'm gonna do is I'll, I'll start my demo and then I'm gonna do a screen share and share some images and talk a little bit and then we'll finish the dish. Um, but uh, the whole purpose uh, to kind of situate my perspective this whole uh, presentation, I feel like is really important, especially because of all the pressures of the pandemic, all of the new changes, the different forms of loss that we've encountered, uh, many, many variables that are outside. Sometimes they are all environmental, sometimes they are interpersonal and um, they come from within. So being able to navigate the, uh, our, our new reality with um, public health in mind and healing, and maybe it's, it's even changing some of our professional goals. Maybe it's strengthening them to uh, in the areas of public health, epidemiology, nutrition, agriculture. There are a number of different fields and professions that have been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And across Native communities, um, a lot of times when it comes to dealing with our vulnerable populations, the food issues are kind of at the back burner to many other social, uh, social ills and health disparities. So um, um, we're gonna kind of combine all of these elements and uh, present a presentation that, that kind of demonstrates why native foods can be a form of self-care and all of the other um, elements attached to it. And so I currently work in uh, substance abuse treatment and mental health as well as a chef. So, I'm, a, I'm an advanced certified relapse prevention specialist and I'm also a behavioral health technician and also all my years of professional cooking. So I, I kind of fused together these, uh, these modalities and practices from the group dynamics of working in a professional kitchen and building, building and training people. And then also the uh, emotional, intellectual, spiritual um, modalities of recovery. So uh, I hope you follow along and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. So um, I'm gonna get started. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a dish and uh, I'm gonna start it and then I'll switch to the screen share. And then as we're sharing and talking, um, this is gonna be done because I'm gonna take, I'm gonna do a dish and you'll see why it's gonna come together, the, uh, why I've chosen it. So I'm gonna do it, this is, um, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite breakfast dishes, dishes. So this is what I want to share as a form of self-care because it's using indigenous foods, but it's also a integration of other uh, old world foods too. So um, I'm, I'm using this for a, a couple of specific purposes. And so I've got some, uh, some rolled oats, uh, organic rolled oats, and I've got some organic white quinoa here. Um, what I'm gonna do first, is I'm gonna take my quinoa, and this is to help me, um, I've got one, half a cup. I'm gonna do um, one cup total, so half and half. I'm gonna do 50% uh, quinoa and 50% uh, oatmeal. But the quinoa takes a little bit longer to cook, so I'm gonna start it first. And here's what I like to do. I get a nice, my, my flame is on, and I wanna take it and I toast my quinoa first. So there's a half cup there. And you can use a spoon however you want, but that was half a cup of quinoa. And I'll put this off to the side. And to me, this is a, a nice way of changing the flavor without adding more salt, right? 
if you're trying to watch your salt intake and other things like that, um, you can toast your quinoa in a dry pan. This is just a basic sauce pot. There's no oil in there. And you just put on like a medium high heat. And then you wait until it starts to crackle. And depending on how you want it, you can make it golden brown or you can just toast it until it gets fragrant. So you can hear it. Um, it starts to crackle and pop. Do not walk away from it when you start this. You want to watch it and keep stirring it. You either you can toss it or you can use a spoon, a wooden spoon, and just keep stirring it around. Um, I like to use, I just like to swirl the pan off the heat and give it a gentle toss. The, as soon as I start to hear it crackle, that's when I start to stir it. So let me see. I mean, I'm going to kind of put it near the microphone to see if you can hear it. So the more it toasts, the flavor changes. It develops this nice fragrant uh, uh, flavor. And you can, you can toast it just until it starts to lightly, lightly smoke. See, look, listen, watch. OK. Can you hear that? It's toasting. And it's just lightly, lightly smoking, just barely. That's about as far as I want to take it. You can also do this in the oven on a cookie sheet. Um, but I like to do it in a pan because if you do it on a cookie sheet, um, those the little quinoa as they pop, they kind of go out all over into your oven. So I prefer to do it like this and keep stir, uh, stirring it and shaking it. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the, the ratio for quinoa and uh, the same ratio with the oatmeal, it's about two to one. So I'm going to do um, one cup total of, um, of quinoa and oatmeal. And I'm going to do two cups and maybe two and a half uh, cups of water. And so if you could see this, it's just lightly, lightly toasting. And it smells nice and fragrant. The, it smells like um, almost like toasted sunflower seeds or almost like toasted almonds, um, toasted quinoa, right? <laughs> so um, I'm going to turn it down now. And I'm going to take my water. So there's two cups, OK? Notice I have not added any um, oatmeal yet because this will only take like four minutes or so. This will take about 50, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm going to get it started and we'll start, we'll start the, the presentation. So that was uh, two cups in my, my, uh, my measuring cup here. And all I'm going to do is just turn it up just a little bit. I'm going to bring it to a boil and I'll... Uh, We'll start the screen share. So you could say um, in the time it takes to boil quinoa, we're going to talk about indigenous foods and self-care. Then we'll, we'll come back and finish the demo and we'll talk a little bit more, okay? So I'll put a nice little lid on it and uh, I'm going to do my screen share now. So let me see. Nephi, do you wash the quinoa first? Uh, yeah, you can if you like, and then, but then you would have to re-dry it out again. Um, a lot of times for me, for me, I don't really, um, the quinoa that I get, and usually I don't, I hardly rarely get the bitterness, um, but, um, but yeah, you can do that if you like. Okay, so um, let me minimize my screen. So this, this the short presentation I want to put together as its title is Indigenous Foodways and Self-Care. Um, this is uh, understanding how traumatic experiences in influence our diet, food choices, and health. And for all of us that are studying public health, for all of us that plan to continue our work in Native communities, in marginalized communities, in the BIPOC community, uh, in communities of, um, that uh, really need our services in terms of uh, food, nutrition, social work, recovery, um, we really kind of need to understand how and why food is so important in all of these modalities and across all of these professions. And so what I hope this presentation can help you kind of understand and maybe spark some creative thought is to uh, uh, really kind of take a creative look at your, your approach to your discipline and your, your future and how you can integrate uh, themes of uh, vitality, resilience, creativity, um, as you practice self-care, because remember, as you probably already know, the field of social work, many of these different professions, the helping professions are very, very taxing emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So to counterbalance all that we're giving to our work, we really need to be conscious of taking care of ourselves. 
And remember, your job is not self-care. So if you're a if you're a clinician and a therapist, or if you're a if you're a nutritionist, or if you're a chef, or if you're a farmer, just because those can be self-care practices, it doesn't make it self-care. So you got to separate the two and make time for an activity that you love or you want to learn as self-care. So uh, we'll get started on this. Let me see. Okay, so um, the introduction. Uh, this is pretty common in the field of social work and uh, uh, therapy culture and recovery culture. Um, some of you probably might have heard it, but this is a diagram that, sh that shares the uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente study or the ACE uh, pyramid. This uh, adverse childhood experiences is what it's referring to. And those of you that may know it, this was a study that was done over a few decades that followed um, children from their, from their youth all the way into their adolescence. And what it is, is it's a tool for uh, understanding how trauma and social location can affect us as we're growing up. And so basically adverse childhood experiences is all of the chaos that we may or may not have experienced as children. And for us as across indigenous communities, we really have to be conscious about the intergenerational impact of, of the uh, parenting patterns we, were, we inherited, the behavioral patterns we inherited, and the food choices we inherited because the, 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 the triangle on the left, I mean, on the left of the screen, that's the general study. And then on the right side, um, as we continue to move forward, we've got to expand this work. So as you can see, the second, the pyramid on the right is much larger and it includes race, social conditions, local context. And then it even goes deeper to include generational embodiment of historical trauma. And I want to talk, I want to mention that uh, the term historical trauma as a, uh, as a clinical term or an academic term or a professional term that allows us native peoples to understand our experience, the word and the term historical trauma is, is about less than 40 years old. So that means from, a, from for us as native peoples, using a Western paradigm to articulate an indigenous experience, that is still evolving. And so we are a part of a generation that has this really amazing opportunity to continue to expand modalities as we see it fit as native peoples. And to me, that's like the, 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 the really amazing and exciting uh, thing to look forward to even after amidst a pandemic and after a pandemic, because we know how to self-diagnose our own native communities and when we trust in our communities, we can really be creative and make a lot of things happen. So um, that's the, uh, the ACE uh, pyramid. There are a ton of great resources on it. It's so fun to geek out on, but it's very, very important for us to understand our own ACEs. This is not to blame anyone. This is not to blame the system. This is not to blame the government. This is not to blame our parents. This is nothing like that. This is putting all the tools on the table so we can look at it logically and understand ourselves and continue to grow and heal. So uh, trauma as we experience it, as indigenous peoples, we perceive trauma as an ever-present obstacle which hinders emotional, intellectual, and spiritual development. Trauma as an obstacle hinders food knowledge and nutritional decision-making patterns, thus impacting health. So trauma as a barrier to health contributes to disease, addiction, substance use disorder, and many forms of violence. So we have to really describe and articulate for ourselves across native communities, how trauma impacts us because each region of Turtle Island or North and South America is different. Some of the colonial variables are more intense. Some of the environmental factors are more intense. Some of us have direct access to land and some of us may not. So we really need to buckle down and describe uh, what a traumatic experience is because there are many forms of it. Here in this, um, this violence wheel, there's many different forms of violence there listed, but at the core of all violence, it's always about power and control. So here you see some examples of, from emotional abuse to threats, to using male privilege, to intimidation, to isolation, 
And there are many, many more. There's even spiritual violence. There's even emotional violence. There's even colonial violence. So we really need to begin by journeying within to understand how we might have been complicit, participatory, or engaging in this, these type of things um, so we can disengage as practitioners. Um, <clears throat> and food is so amazing. If you, if you take the time and begin to geek out on it, um, it there's so much evolving research in, in, in food, nutrition, and native foods, and agriculture. Um, but ultimately, one of the most uh, exciting things is that there, you, you have a second brain. And pain, I, this, this slide here says pain and your second brain. So your second brain is actually your gastrointestinal tract, your stomach and your intestines. And when we were an embryo forming in our, in our mother's womb, the same clump of cells that formed the brain, they split and formed the digestive tract. And so it's not that emotion and intellect are stored in our gut, but memory exists in our gut. So a lot of um, neuroscience and a lot of um, research in like the, the uh, gut biome and the microbiome is really exciting to talk about how we can understand trauma and food choices and how we can use neuroscience, nutrition, indigeneity to create new modalities or revitalize modalities to really um, create really healthy and amazing uh, patterning and futures. So uh, your gut produces more of the feel good uh, transmitter of uh, um, neurotransmitter of serotonin than your brain. Can you imagine that? So that, 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 that kind of tells us why food is so powerful when we enjoy it. Um, the, the balance of good and, good and bad bacteria in your gut is the foundation for health and, and our recovery. So, um, Something really important to look in mind. There, there's a lot of really exciting lectures and resources and new periodicals and information coming out. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Just go online and begin to Google or look up um, like pain in your second brain or second brain or look up a microbiome. Uh, you can even look up like neuro decolonization. There's all these really kind of neat and evolving things to add into our work. Um, and so, we have to be really conscious of that because food can become a drug of choice. It does have that impact because certain foods produce neurotransmitters in our brain that are directly connected to pleasure centers and that help to elevate our mood. So in here, I put uh, some of those traditional foods like the fry bread, tortillas, and the, the Indian taco or the Navajo taco, not to shame those foods, but to display them as facts that we risk um, if we overconsume that, we all know the health outcomes, right? And then if we're going to look at our, the ACEs and trauma and our food choices, we understand why it's so prevalent across uh, communities of poverty or uh, uh, vulnerable communities like ours. So um, we really need to be aware as we move forward because in this, we have to understand our own trauma narrative and pleasure seeking. So for individuals that survive abuse or violation physically, emotionally, or spiritually, food can become a form of not only finding control and chaos, but a way of finding comfort. And I think this is really important as we not only just understand our profession or our work, but we have to understand ourselves. All of us that are in this field of social work or we're, we're interested in health and we're interested in helping people, we've all got a commonality that draws us together. There's a spirit of generosity that unites us in this work. But what is behind that? What drove us to enter a field and give our lives to helping others? And this is one of those areas that sometimes may not really be discussed. So we look back at our, tra at our, uh, our trauma narrative and understand it, not judge it, but we work with it as tools because I guarantee your trauma narrative, whether it's yours or a client's or a, or a colleague's, it can be the powerful foundation that you stand on. And that, that is true. So um, food choices and serotonin. So in the brain, this just talks about acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter that regulates mood, fears, mental focus, a whole number of things. And then also in the gut where serotonin is also, also produced 
from food cravings, digestion, nutrient absorption. Um, they say that fight, flight, or freeze resides in the, in the gut. So when we have that, when we hear that term, trust your gut feeling, you feel that in your, in your gut first and it sends a message to your brain and your brain puts a label on it to intellectualize and understand it. But fight, flight, and survival and freeze exist in the gut. So um, really interesting uh, facts for us to begin to work with as we create um, amazing uh, modalities for the future because we really have to be cognizant of colonization foods and how we can begin to heal together because we are experiencing recovery in an age of fast food and disease. And it's even more um, prevalent now with the coronavirus pandemic and how uh, the world is more conscious of epidemiology, public health, sanitation, um, the basic practice of washing your hands, right? The world is ready for these type of changes that our work can bring. Whether you're a clinician, a social worker, a chef, a farmer, a literary person, a poet, you have the ability when you understand this root cause, you can really do some uh, amazing articulation and really create some amazing work. So um, feel good colonization foods. I just put this uh, this graphic here because they're, they're comprised of carbohydrates and sugars found in a lot of colonizer foods, including uh, breads, wheat flour, pastas, desserts, pastries, cookies, all of those sweets, right? But remember, those are really triggering serotonin. They're really making us feel good temporarily and they come with the crash, right? And then on the, on the right side here, I just listed some of the very, very common ingredients that were in the military food rations that became the commodity foods. So um, wheat, lard, beer, sugar, rice, beef, chicken, pork, fry bread, flour, gravy, whiskey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we know all these traditional foods across Native America that were rooted in violence um, and colonization. So um, we can't, we really, really, really need to be aware of um, these things because understanding the trauma and the violence in our communities and our lives is the first step. I feel like that's, that's the necessary piece of this uh, personal recovery process, but also familial recovery process and then community recovery process, even an institutional recovery process. Because as we know, there's institutional racism, there's institutional violence. So when we get into that study to understand like maybe trauma-informed care or different health modalities that allow people to um, treat themselves and work through this, these, these pains, we risk staying stuck there. So we have to move beyond, not forget. We have to practice the accountability and then we begin to evolve. In the beginning, the historical trauma themes are very attractive and they can produce this kind of revolutionary spirit, right? But we have to remember that we've got to take care of ourselves to, in order to continue this, this work because this work is gonna last the rest of our lives and our children's lives. So we really begin to begin to study and develop protective factors. And for us as native peoples, our culture is our medicine. I just listed a whole bunch of different um, common community activities. These are all examples of protective factors. They are all, they all unite people. They are all exercise activities. They are all creative. Uh, they, many of them are food related. Many of them are thousands and thousands of years old in terms of culinary and agricultural traditions. So when we really look at the, the kind of the notion of holistic health or holistic healing or holistic approaches, we are really seeing that indigeneity and indigenous culture can validate Western practices for us, not the other way around. We don't need therapy culture to really come in and diagnose and tell us we can diagnose and tell therapy culture what we need for our own communities. And isn't that cool? That's like one of the neatest things, but it takes us, we have to have the time and the focus to begin to kind of understand these steps. So I'm offering this to you as kind of a creative spark, I hope, or a seed that I can plant 
So you can begin to do your own investigation, do your own uh, micro regional development because it is very exciting. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we start off with our childhood. We have these experiences in our youth, whether we grew up on the res and poverty and we didn't have access to food or that we experienced some form of violence. Um, then we, we, get, we get older, we decide to help people, and then we decide to learn how to help ourselves. Um, one, of the many, one of the powerful elements is mindful practices. And it's kind of more popular in the past 15, 20 years or so. Um, but once we look at it, you know, when you say the term mindfulness practices, people think West, uh, Eastern, uh, uh, Western medicine or Chinese medicine. Yeah, that's true. But indigenous culture is also packed full of um, indigenous mindfulness practices. And again, going in line with our culture is medicine um, theme, we already have some of these modalities there. So this slide here, this is the cool stuff that you can geek out on for weeks and days and the rest of our months because um, the term neuro decolonization and indigenous mindfulness this is where we begin to heal at like the atomic level, right? So neurogenesis, the process by which new neurons are, are formed in the brain. Neurogenesis is crucial when an embryo is developing, but also continues in the certain uh, brain regions after birth and throughout the lifespan. And then neuroplasticity, right? The ability of the brain to change in structure and function in response to experience. When we think, feel, and act in novel ways, we change our brains. So I'm going to read that again. When we think, feel, and act in novel ways, we change our brains. So think of all those protective factors that are listed. Many of those are behavioral. Matter of fact, they are all behavioral. And if you've ever heard that term, um, uh, trust your mind, the body will follow, or your, you change your behaviors and your mind will follow. That's kind of one of the everyday um, examples of how these uh, food ways can be self-care that are really impacting our brain reconstruction and our brain health. Um, so, so a really uh, neat thing to, uh, for, for you to begin to contemplate and maybe even get into. And I really encourage practicing meditation. Um, find a mindful practice. For me, cooking is sometimes a very meditative thing because it gets me, allows me to use my hands. I'm outside of my thoughts. I'm using all five of my senses, including the sixth sense of spiritual thought and emotion, right? The unseen realm. Because when I cook, I cook from memory and that's the unseen realm, right? So all five of our senses and our intellect are activated when we're practicing a mindfulness act like cooking. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I really encourage you to take a look at your own personal ethics, at your own personal background, at your own personal history and your, the history of your family and your region and your tribe um, so that we can begin to highlight the principles and the values that have held us up since time immemorial. I guarantee many of those principles and values are connected directly to food. They're connected directly to the rivers and to the land and to the trees and to the seasons. And this, this example right here is just the list that I've chosen for some of to kind of encapsulate some of the, our approaches, honesty, humility, responsibility, integrity, clarity, discipline, compassion, love, respect, courage, and indigeneity. Because if we don't feel safe to live out our indigenousness, we're, we're limited in our complete healing because as native peoples, that's just who we are. And so um, in this, we must participate in our own evolution. We can't spectate in this process of uh, cultural resurgence. We have to be active. We have to be creative. We have to lead with enthusiasm. We have to create things that are accessible and they look possible. Um, because remember, if it's not, uh, if it's neither um, if it's not accessible to the poor, it's neither uh, radical nor revolutionary, right? I saw a really cool uh, quote like that. So um, when it comes to self-care, this says, Zif the guys on and day, and that means White Mountain Apaches. That's the tribe that I'm from. And remember, when it comes to self-care, tell yourself this, I deserve to be happy. And no, all courtiness aside, that's true because 
we deserve to be happy throughout all the centuries of evolution and vitality and survivance. Native peoples are still thriving and existing and we still have a lot of work to do and we deserve to be happy. So access to food, access to care and creative programming is a must. So um, keep that in mind and uh, thank you because we are supporting an indigenous food culture. We are supporting an indigenous food culture building. Just like there's academic culture, there's medicine culture, there's law, legal culture, all of the different types of cultures, we are creating one that focuses on native foods, uh, whether it's at the agricultural side, the culinary, the nutritional, the home cooks, the food is at the nucleus of our identities. And so um, you are supporting that by being here. Um, tonight. So as I was talking, um, as I was talking, I added my, uh, my oatmeal. So just another, um, another half cup. So let's take a look. Oh, yeah. So what did you think of that presentation? This is almost done. I'm going to add just a touch of water. So this is going to be um, about three cups total because I like my, my quinoa and oatmeal a little bit runny. Just a touch. Okay. So as you can see, the, uh, the oats are almost cooked. I like them to have a little bit of bite to it, but you can see it's, it's kind of fluid. It's not like, a, it's not cooked fluffy like rice. It's still gonna be a porridge. And so I'm gonna cover it and I will uh, continue to uh, um, talk a little bit more. So that presentation, I hope, uh, enables you to think creatively and um, really to take a deeper look at our cultural strengths, at things that we've always known since time immemorial. And as it comes to native foods as a form of self-care, I wanted to remind all of us today and tonight that Remember about 70% of all of the foods in the grocery store, um, they're indigenous foods of the Americas. And sometimes when, we, when, we, um, when we're doing our best to create approaches and recipes and you know, practice cultural revitalization or cultural reclamation, sometimes we wanna go to like the real hardcore organic, hard um, hand harvested, wild, you know, all that really hardcore stuff and that's almost for like advanced practitioners, right? And sometimes when we take that approach, we can end up creating more barriers um, for, our, for, our, for our population that we're dealing with. So I feel like the first step in cooking as self-care as it relates to native foods is identifying foods of the Americas, indigenous cultivars, the, the animals, the shellfish, the, the large game, the small game, that were sources of protein. And then the long history of indigenous cultivars from Argentina through central Mexico, all the way up to North America and into Alaska. And then you will see how much indigenous food waste have changed the world. And then you will see that every single cuisine on the planet that is famous and luxurious are using native foods. But the history of colonization and the uh, ethnogenocide of people, land and waters has, has caused this erasure of this food history. So um, that's some, sometimes that's the reason why we don't see potatoes as an indigenous food, but these are indigenous to South America. Um, all types of squash are indigenous to the Americas. All of the colors, the, the varieties from Hubbard to Kobacha to squash with Japanese names to squash with Italian names, they are all indigenous to the Americas. Every single variety of tomato is indigenous to the Americas. And these are just romas. I'm using the ingredients that I picked up at a grocery store um, because the native foods are all around us. Every single type of chili is indigenous to the Americas. Think of all the spicy cooking of Asia and India, all over the Mediterranean, how foods are flavored with capsaicin or the heat from chilies. That was not like that before 1500. Matter of fact, all of these ingredients did not exist anywhere in Eurasia prior to 1500, prior to the encounter with indigenous peoples and the, the violent appropriation of uh, indigenous technologies. 
like basketry, metallurgy, farming, astrology, mathematics, medicine, all of these practices make it back to the old world and they change the world, right? And then it's indigenous food ways that allows America to become a world power. Remember that. So when you're thinking of uh, indigenous foods and uh, for health, um, all of American cuisine is built on indigenous foods. It's kind of like that hashtag, you are on Indian land, right? You go into any restaurant in the world, you could say you are eating native food, <laughs> right? Um, so my, my quinoa is almost done. Um, one other thing I wanted to share was equipment choices. If you're gonna invest in the journey of cooking, remember it's a journey. You learn a new recipe, you learn a new technique, it goes in the bank, it never goes away and it only gets stronger and you can pass it on. So if you're gonna invest in some, 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 uh, some new skills and expanding your food paradigm, uh, might as well invest in some uh, quality equipment too. So I brought a couple examples of uh, some quality equipment I store my nonstick pans on towels so they don't um, so they don't get scratched up. But uh, I, the reason I brought these out here was because um, here's a invest in a good quality pan. Heavy pots and pans if you can afford it. Um, great places to find them are like thrift stores and thrift shops. You're like on the hunt for for all these really great pots and pans that are out there. But um, try to stay away from um, the thinner ones. So. So here's an example of one that's a little bit inexpensive. I think I got this at one of those like Dollar Generals because I was in a rush and I needed a pan and I just bought one. But this one is a really thin one. The pan is very, very thin. The plastic is, the handle is plastic. So I'm really limited with what I can do with this pan. This really thin pan is not gonna conduct heat well. It's gonna conduct heat uneven. So if I put a steak or a piece of fish or something in here, it's gonna cool down right where that meat is at or the protein is at, and it's gonna be hot all the way around here. And that's, that's gonna be an uneven heat distribution. But when you invest in a, a heavy pan, here's the difference, right? Listen, it's almost like a bell. You can hear it echoing. That's an example of a, a less than desirable pan, right? but you invest in quality to last you a long time because remember these cooking skills are gonna last the rest of your life. Invest in quality, something heavy, nice and sturdy. This one is an all clad, but there's all kinds of great um, other varieties out there. But this handle is metal, it's got rivets and I can sear something and throw it in the oven and finish baking, with, baking something in there. So just a little tip on uh, cooking tools. Um, this cutting board right here is like uh, 20, 21 years old and I've had it since 2000. So investing in quality is really important. Uh, two other components on your journey of learning cooking for self-care that will really improve your outcomes is um, I use kosher salt almost all the time. And then I get a pepper mill. Um, this will really help out in uh, adding a lot of flavor and depth to your dishes. But uh, if you can find one, Try to find one that has a metal grinder because the, uh, the plastic ones will dull over time. Um, but these are really, really handy. And I encourage you to get one. They're, 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 they're really cool and they'll last a long time. So let me check on our quinoa. Okay, we're good. So yes, perfect. So now what I'm sharing with you is one of my, my favorite breakfast foods. Again, this is half quinoa, half uh, rolled oats. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add some components to it. I got some blueberries. This is just about, I'm being generous here. Uh, this is about a, maybe a half a cup or two thirds of a cup. I got some raspberries, about the same amount. And then um, I'm choosing these ingredients to complement the presentation. So neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, um, what enables that is proteins. So when we eat colorful foods, um, we, we need proteins to help those, uh, the process of neuroplasticity to happen, to regenerate new neural pathways. Once upon a time, it was kind of said that once we, uh, once we killed brain cells, they were gone forever. But now we know that's not true. And we can practice our way into health and healing. So I got a lot of protein in my, my quinoa here. And then I'm gonna use my um, raspberries and blueberries, again, indigenous foods. 
and I'm going to macerate these. I'm choosing the dark colored berries for their polyphenols. I want them to help purify my blood. I want them to contribute to the clarity of my thinking, right? And so what I'm going to macerate them in, macerating is just giving them a, a little bit of uh, sweetness. Think of it this way. You marinate meats and you macerate fruits. So um, typically, what you, how you macerate is with white sugar. And for me, I don't want to do that. I'm going to take, um, I'm going to use a sugar that our my Apache people have been already consuming for thousands of years. And this is agave syrup. And uh, it's an organic one. And um, here in the American Southwest, the agave plant, uh, for us, we call it Apache sugar cane, or in our language, we call it ikaz. And so um, I'm choosing that because it's an ancestral food that's readily available to me. So I'm just going to take it and just give it a light drizzle. I'm not going to drench it. I just want to just coat it and boost the sweetness already. Then I'm going to give it a little bit of acidity, a little bit of fragrance with uh, some lemon. And I'm not trying to make it sour. I'm just using the acidity and the flavor of the lemon to brighten it up. So just add a couple drops, just, just a couple drops like that. And we'll just give it a, it's just that simple. You just take it and you just mix it in. You could rip some mint here in the springtime. You could rip some basil in here. Um, you could do um, um, some other types of berries, but ultimately you're just coating them until they get a nice glossy sheen on there. See that? And so um, I'll even take um, a couple of these uh, really delicious hazelnuts that I got. We'll bring in the Pacific Northwest, right? So I'll take a couple of these guys and just crack them. And then I've got, um, I'm, I got another, this is our Western Apache seed mix. There's um, sunflower seeds, corn, pinions, squash seeds, amaranth, and uh, parched corn and uh, acorns in here. So I'll take a little bit of this too, again, because I'm looking for crunch, but I'm also looking for density in, the, in my food choices uh, in terms of nutrition. So this is a really old school traditional food uh, flavor combination. So um, I'm gonna take these two. This one is already done. I just crushed my hazelnuts a little bit and we'll serve this up. This is a really awesome breakfast. Again, half and half quinoa to oatmeal. And um, I'm ready for any questions. If anyone has one, this, is, this demo is coming together good. This is a really protein packed breakfast here is one of my favorites. You're, I'm getting very hungry watching you, Nephi. <laughs> we do have a couple questions. I'll just, you're getting some love from your, um, some folks about your background there. Who made your knife board behind you? Yeah, it, um, um, this is uh, in our work with native foods in my community and across native communities, it's difficult for us to find imagery of ourselves as natives. And it's even harder to find specific imagery of like say white mountain Apaches. So if the medium or the, the, mo the terminology or the visuals don't exist to communicate your indigenous experience, create it. And that's what we did here. Um, this is kind of geared towards a younger, younger age demographic. And it says knife skills are life skills. And this is a young chef in training so that uh, one, of the, one of the obstacles or one of the challenges we have when it comes to food and nutrition work in Native communities, or at least in mine, is making it seem cool, right? So that's kind of what we, we did. Uh, we just turned this into a graphic. This is one of our favorite wild foods in the summertime. Uh, this is a young Apache guy. He's probably like a line cook or a, a sous chef. He's on the journey of learning. So he's, his uh, war paint, his headband, and his eagle feather they uh, they kind of um, kind of symbolize his battle to become a chef. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really neat. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I'll go on to another question here. Someone asked if you can share a little bit more about how you have used and seen food work as part of the recovery process for some of the individuals that you work with. <clears throat> That's so good. <laughs> that macerated raspberry is so good. Um, 
the food and the recovery process is very important. Um, a lot of times in, uh, think of it this way, anytime we go to um, begin a healing journey from a diagnosis from a doctor or we get prescriptions, a lot of times a big part of the, the, he, the, the approach to healing is behavioral. So they'll say exercise, change your diet, drink a lot of water, go for a walk, um, get up through, you know, numerous times during the day. And when it comes to recovery, it's, it's no different. Recovery is about changing behaviors, right? Because when we change behaviors, your thinking follows. If you can provide someone with a pathway that's cultural and culinary, you, you provide them with a journey to get their own evidence. Just for example, everything that I'm saying is, is uh, just kind of a collection of information. But until a person in, uh, activates it and does it for themselves, they get the evidence that it's working for them. And that's kind of how the recovery process happens. And uh, think of also the, um, when it comes to, if you're talking recovery from say addiction or substance abuse, the, um, a lot of times that's rooted in traumas and that produces this, uh, this void or they call it a spiritual malady. And when you connect with food ways, you're connecting with um, history, time and place, but also you're focusing on the moment because of seasonality. So it really is a reconnecting piece that sometimes a lot of times overlooked. So let's change that together. Yeah, that's great. I have a follow-up question to that one. Have you um, seen since the pandemic, has this virtual way of doing things created more opportunities to help what your clients or other native peoples, or have you encountered a lot of barriers as to seeing those outcomes that you want to see. <clears throat> I think um, uh, it has produced, uh, like for me, I'm on the White Mountain Apache tribe in Northeastern Arizona. So we're very rural. One of the obstacles is uh, um, internet access, um, but we have been very fortunate to get, um, to be creative in, in the agency I work with. And so switching to telehealth is one of the main things that we've done kind of taken the, the philosophy or the idea or the reality that, uh, where's mine? Um, everyone has a phone, right? So everyone has potential access to Zoom or to links like that. It's just a matter of getting the word, the, the word out there. Um, so, and then think of it this way too, uh, a lot of the native food practices say it's springtime, right? A lot of these foraging practices, you're outdoors, you're absorbing vitamin D from the sun and you can social distance with the people you quarantine with. So it's still something you can do if you just kind of instill it and get the right mindset and encourage people. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for saying that. I agree. And now that the spring is coming, I'm getting outdoors even more myself. Um, someone was curious if you would be willing to share the recipe that you just um, shared with us if we can email that to everyone. Yeah, yeah, I could. Um, one, of, one of the journeys of, of cooking is to, uh, recipes help you in the beginning, but a lot of cooking is about ratio and common sense. So for this was just half quinoa, half, oat, uh, half oatmeal. And then I just, the maceration was just a little bit of agave syrup. You could use honey. Um, and I just a little bit of lemon juice, but yeah, we can definitely share a recipe. Great, thank you. And the food that you buy, I know all the foods you use today are indigenous. Do you prefer to purchase organic food or does that um, matter to you? It, it does matter to me, but it also comes down to uh, being realistic. And uh, what do I have access to? Um, I'm limited by the grocery stores in my area, right? Unless I, uh, and, uh, and the seasonality of what producers bring in. Um, so, and then also add that to people in native communities that are not in the reservation that are in metropolitan areas, the same kind of thing. So even though it is important and it's crucial, sometimes it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon that's out of reach. So um, when we can begin to educate and teach about organics and try to integrate that the best we can into our programming, um, I think we stand a better chance. But again, I always feel like that introductory 
identifying indigenous cultivars of the Americas is a very, very powerful first step because you get people cooking. And then the more that people cook, the more they understand and expand. But if we just rush them into buying only organic and buying orgave and you know that kind of thing, it might be a barrier. So that's kind of how I see that. Thank you. What you mentioned, and you provided a really nice list of protective factors. And one of them was speaking Apache, so speaking your native language. Can you talk a little bit more about the connections that you see between language and foods and how that looks for you um, personally in the work that you do? Yeah, that's, that's such a great question. Thank you for spotting that out and bringing it up because there, there is literally no separation and I think it's pretty common across most native languages that the, the words for certain ingredients are very descriptive. It's not like a name, like um, not like hazelnut, right? Yeah, when a lot of our indigenous languages describe either how it grows, what it looks like, or where it grows. A lot of the names in our indigenous language describe the behaviors or the mannerisms of animals or people or environments, right? So um, it's kind of like uh, my, my dad used to say, speaking Navajo is like mental television, right? So when you're speaking that language, you're getting all these images in your mind. And so the same thing is true uh, with, with the food ways. So integrating the language revitalization practices is just as important as the food, because I think the deeper we get into it, the more we learn, there's no separation. And for me, myself, I'm not a fluent Apache language or Navajo language speaker, but the foods are taking me on this journey of learning those things slowly. So that's a great question. Thank you. I hope I helped with that answer. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think um, I recently, someone recently shared with me that one of the things they did was label their foods and, and start relearning that language in that way. And so that's a nice connection too. Um, that, that people make themselves with their own languages, which is good. And I have some practical questions for you. Yeah. And in terms of identifying fruit being ripe and the best kind of fruit or the best type of food for cooking in terms of nutrition and flavor, what advice would you give to growers and foragers? Uh, to growers and foragers, hmm. They're like um, the growers and the foragers are like the experts in the field, right? To the everyday consumer or the everyday student or the everyday uh, working person, the, the foragers and the growers have this wealth of knowledge, right? So I think maybe translating that knowledge and that experience into um, um, things that, that everyday consumers can understand or uh, uh, middle school students can understand or elementary kids can understand um, because I feel like so much of what we do from cooking to the foraging to the agriculture, again, is behavioral. And so, um, and it's engaging too. It sparks curiosity, um, taking someone out to a farm and letting them take a tour of your, your field, um, doing guided tours in areas that are safe and legal, right? Um, but if you're going to go foraging, um, I think of the foraging, just make sure you're, you're, you're an expert um, identifier of cultivars because you don't want to get anybody accidentally sick or you don't know who might be allergic to what. Um, but I think making it accessible and relevant is very, very important. And that's what I try to do with food and cooking. And how, how would you know, I guess, if you were out there um, picking or foraging, how would you know when a food is at its nutritional peak? A lot of times the foods will tell you it's itself. Um, sometimes it's when they've matured and they've gone to seed. Sometimes it's when they're, they're most colorful. And think of it this way too, foods have an identity at every single um, level of their life. So for some, some ingredients can be eaten when they're little greens like amaranth. You can eat amaranth lettuce. Uh, you can eat amaranth greens like a lettuce. You can saute them and cook them. Um, you can wait until they've matured and they produce the seed and you get all that protein. Um, so I think it just comes down to being able to know when the, the, the plants or the, uh, the animals are telling us 
And that just comes through um, uh, research too and your own independent study. Yeah, thank you. We have someone comment in the chat here. She shared that it was similar for her when she worked in Northern Minnesota and discovered what real, real wild rice was and learning firsthand how it is harvested in the lakes and in the canoes and, and then hand parched told her so much about the land, the waters and to the traditional practices of the seasons and the respect for the nutritional value of indigenous food. So I, I just wanted to share that comment with you. I, I really like that because um, that is an example of how foods teach us. That's an example of how foods are caring relatives, right? That's an example of how one cultivar teaches us so much about environment, history, science, ourselves, hard work. So that's one positive example. And we could apply that metaphor to every single indigenous cultivar of the Americas. That's cool. Yeah, Sarah, thank you for, for making that comment to us. I really appreciate that. Another question we have, what are some common kitchen staples or what are some kitchen staples that you recommend all people have in their kitchen? Ah, good. <laughs> um, a nice solid cutting board. This one I usually mostly cut vegetables on. Um, I have another one that I cut meat and fish on at home, um, but also uh, knives. Where's my, my knives? So um, good quality knives. You don't have to get too fancy and expensive right away. Remember a sharp knife is a safe knife, but if you can uh, invest in a decent one that has good balance, that has uh, the, the, the three rivets and a full tang, um, it'll last you a long time. And when you invest in buying a good knife, also look up some tutorials on knife sharpening and keep it sharp. It'll last for a long time. Um, a good cutting board, good heavy pots and pans, um, pepper mills, um, learn about different types of salt because salts are all different um, and good quality uh, tools, you know? There's all kinds of cool cooking tools that you can, that you can get but uh, I usually always have good wooden spoons of different shapes and sizes. Um, I got a microplane, different types of uh, tongs. Um, but I say just begin with good cutting boards, solid and quality pots and pans, uh, salt and pepper and good knives. Um, then you'll, you'll go from there. And to start your collection, you can start with just a, a decent chef knife, a decent paring knife, and, uh, and a steel to keep it sharp. Um, that's like the good starter kit right there. Just those three. Then you can build and build it the farther you, the more you get into it. And try not to drop it like that. <laughs> yeah, go. what about um, seasonings or herbs and spices you recommend? Um, yeah, for, for me, uh, here, here's kind of a tip is um, you can, um, you can look at cooking as like uh, five principles, hot, sour, salty, sweet, and umami. Um, so once you understand those basics and you learn how to combine those and balance them, you'll be, you'll be a much, much better cook. Um, so we could say, uh, I've got this example right here, some chili flakes of hot, right? So I've got hot, then I've got sour with acid, uh, citric acid and vinegars, um, hot, sour, I got salty, I've got sweet. And then I could say that uh, like roasted tomatoes produce that umami effect. Uh, roasted, uh, roasted tomatoes, I mean, Parmesan cheese, uh, mushrooms, roasted meats, roasted fish, um, a lot of uh, different foods produce an umami effect. And that's kind of that really umptuous, you want more kind of uh, uh, impact. So when you are able to identify hot, sour, salty, sweet, and umami in foods and where they exist, you'll learn how to pull them out and balance them and combine them. That's how I would say um, ingredient-wise to categorize really simply. That's great. Thanks for sharing. I always forget those five and, and you've told me those before. Uh, and then I have one more question before we wrap up. I know we're getting to close to time here. Do you have any resources or 
um, recipe books or, or something um, along those lines that you would recommend for beginners or for experienced cooks in general? Um, there, there's a number of really great resources. Uh, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning of my, uh, my presentation, um, when it came to native foods, about you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was very difficult to find information on uh, native foods or indigenous foods. Now, fast forward 20 years um, with, the, with the interconnectedness of the internet and uh, the vast spread of knowledge, you can find some really great resources by uh, simply uh, Googling indigenous foods, indigenous chefs, and following hashtags like indigenous food sovereignty or looking up uh, indigenous nutrition for vulnerable populations. Just get really creative and use the internet as a tool to be able to find some of those resources because there's a number of books out there. Uh, remember, a lot of the cookbooks and a lot of what I stand on as a chef, there's a long body of academic research in terms of botany, ethnobotany, language, water rights, uh, land access, and the legal political aspect of being native. So there's much, much longer um, uh, depth of bodies of work in, uh, beyond cookbooks too. So, um, but I, that's how I would suggest to start is just start by doing your own investigation on the internet and hit up social media and follow hashtags, you know? That's how I learn. Absolutely, thank you. And I learned by listening to you. So thank you for sharing. I wanna say thank you Nephi so much for this wonderful presentation and food demonstration too. I'm sure everyone is hungry and, and we're gonna go eat some really amazing food. Not that good probably, but we'll try. And I wanna thank Emily too and the Missouri Historical Society for partnering with the Booter Center on this event today. I'll also announce that we will be welcoming um, Chef Nephi Craig on Wednesday for a small virtual talk um, for all of those who registered for the event tonight. You'll get a Zoom invitation link in your inbox either later today or tomorrow morning. So check that out. And he will answer your questions one-on-one -on -one if you have any remaining questions or who will talk about indigenous foods and perhaps maybe even share with us another demonstration. But thank you Nephi so much again and I'll hand it over to Emily. Thank you Kelly. I just want to also say thank you. Thank you to Nephi. Thank you to Kelly. Thank you to everyone for uh, logging in tonight and joining us. I hope that uh, you'll go back and share the YouTube video later when we have that posted, which should be later this week. As Kelly mentioned, we've got the special bonus session on Wednesday. I hope you're able to join that as well. Um, you'll get an email about that. And I hope that you'll also fill out the survey and let us know what you thought and give us some of your feedback. Um, so we always want to hear that so we can keep uh, providing content that's relevant to you and, and useful to you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nephi. Everyone uh, go enjoy some healthy food and have a wonderful night. Thank you.